welcome to this week's Discipleship 101. I'm Grace, I'm one of the ministers in the Nid Valley Circuit. And this week, at the start of a new year, I want to ask the big question, how do I follow Jesus? Now, it seems like such a huge question and such a tiny question at the same time. I don't know where you are in your journey of faith. I don't know whether you've been following Jesus for years, whether you've just been thinking about, is this something I want to know more about? I don't know whether you've been going to church, but have never made the commitment to follow Jesus. Thing is, when it comes to following, it doesn't matter when you start. What matters is that you start. And I was thinking about how I choose to follow Jesus. And that sometimes for me, it's really incredibly difficult. Um, I share the story of when I was at a really boring, really boring um, service in a Methodist church. It was a covenant service and it was full of really long words. And my friend and I were pretty much half asleep in the back corner of this church. The minister was droning on. And during that service, as we prayed the covenant prayer, a prayer that's been prayed for about 350 years, um, maybe slightly less, I, in praying it, heard God say to me, I'm calling you to be a minister. It wasn't an audible voice. I just knew in my gut. And when I spoke to other people, they said, yeah, we see that in you. And I went through the process of saying, God, you can't possibly be calling me to do this. I don't want to do it. And yet all the way through, God kept calling and I kept following. And for each of us, God calls us. And to give you a flavour of that, I want to tell you a story. I sometimes find that listening to a children's story helps me to think about what's happening in a different way. So as I read, I want to ask you the question, how are the people in this story following? Who's following? Who's leading? Who's doing most of the action and most of the work in this story? A long time ago lived a king so bad, he wanted rid of the boys, even this young lad. So the baby was hidden, mum hushed with a shoosh, and put his basket on the river and pushed with a whoosh. I think it should be a shush and a whoosh, don't you? Oh well, we'll go very Yorkshire. Uh, the baby on board sailed along round the bend till he landed on shore, his trip at an end. The king's helpful daughter was doing her washing and found the young baby a splishing and a sploshing. Though her father was nasty, the princess was kinder, so she asked the boy's mum, would you be his child minder? He will play nice and safe under both our noses, and his name, well, who knows, I suppose, could be Moses. Moses grew up seeing family and friends made slaves by the king for his own wicked ends. They were stuck in a rut at the end of the line, no train out of town and no exit sign. Moses was filled with sadness and doubt. They needed a leader to find a way out. That leader's not me, Moses thought as he walked. Yes, it is, said Bush, that caught fire as it talked. Here's a public announcement from God for the nation. That building they're building, let's make it a station. Tell the king that you're leaving for a new home address. One way tickets for all on the Exodus Express. But when Moses demanded, the king gave a sneer. I regret that my slaves travel terminates here. I can't let them go, they need to work harder. So planned engineering work stop their departure. Moses said, God won't accept your delays. So shortly arriving on platform 10, plagues. They'll bring to your palace darkness and lice and famine and flies until you think twice. The skies became dark and the river turned red. The king tapped his loudspeaker. Scythe, 
then said, I'd like to apologise for the delay. Your late running service may get underway. The people rejoiced and they chugged out of town, but the king changed his mind. So he signalled, slow down. Too late, Moses led all his people as planned the non-stop express for the new promised land. But the half million people soon stopped in their tracks in front of the sea with the king at their backs. Moses just trusted that God knew the way. So he looked at the water and started to pray. The sea began swirling, waves crashing and tossing. The water revealed a new channel crossing. So the journey continued. The people moved faster. The king's men behind them were nearing disaster. Moses and passengers tried not to slip as they ran, raced underwater to finish their trip. They clambered and climbed over stones, rocks and boulders, while seawater fell on the king and his soldiers. The sea settled back to the calmest of waters. The king had an early bath with his supporters. God's plan had conquered. The kings had backfired. The journey his journey diverted. His ticket expired. For Moses and friends, this was just one more station. The far promised land was their end destination. So, next time it seems you're stuck, no way back, keep on trusting in God and he'll keep you on track. It's interesting, isn't it, that we hear in that story about what God does. And that's one of the beautiful things about following Jesus, is that you're committing to let God take control of your life. That doesn't mean that you have to suddenly listen to everything that I say because I'm a minister. But it means that you become part of a community of people seeking together to follow Jesus. Think of it a bit like this, hanging on to the train analogy. How many people does it take to run a train service? I can think of several. You need the driver, you need the guard, you need somebody to sell the tickets and somebody to check the tickets. You need somebody to repair the track. If you live in Harrogate, you need a lot of people to work the signals. Um, because we've got loads of level crossings. The list goes on and on, doesn't it? People to do the hospitality, people to go at the station, bing bong, their service is delayed. All of those things. Some of the things I wouldn't mind doing too much. I would quite like to sit in one of those automated signal boxes. Here's how I imagine it. There I am, cup of tea in one hand, butty in the other. I see a light flash up. I look, there's not quite enough traffic out there yet, so I hang on a moment. And just as the traffic starts to build on the road, I press the button. Down go the uh, level crossing barriers. I sit back with my cup of tea, my butty. I wave at the train driver who waves back. Sounds beautiful, doesn't it? I wait, watching the motorists get more and more irate until eventually, go and make another cup of tea, come back and press the button. I like the idea of doing that. Not so keen on one of the other level crossings that I pass regularly, where the poor guy running it has to wear orange high vis and come out from his box in the rain, in the snow, in the sleet, in the blazing heat and shut the gates manually, wait for the train to go past in the freezing, freezing cold to make sure that no pedestrians decide that they're just gonna go through anyway. And then when the train's got past, has to do it all over again, every 20 minutes or so, all day. Oh. I would even less like to be the person who is out repairing the track at four in the morning. Ooh. I certainly wouldn't want to be the person checking the tickets with all those irate customers, but I wouldn't mind being the person who gets to Make me announcements. I wonder which of those sounds like a fun job to you.
and which sounds like a difficult place to be. The thing is that in the story with Moses, upside down, Moses didn't much fancy the job that God had for him. He said, I can't do this. I can't lead these people. I'm not clever enough. I don't know what to say. He had a list of reasons as long as his arm as to why he was the wrong guy for the job. But there's a bit of a problem when you get into that conversation with God. Moses thought he wasn't cut out for it. And yet, scripture tells us that God is the one who does the cutting out. Psalm 139 says that God knit you together in your mother's womb. God created you for a purpose. Is that exciting or is it frightening? Because for me, it's a bit of both knowing that God knows me better than I know myself. So, as we come to pray the covenant prayer, the prayer that's been prayed for 300 odd years, where we commit ourselves to follow Jesus, whether it's for the first time, the 51st time, or even the 101st time this year, as we pray that prayer, we pray it offering ourselves to a God who knows what we're capable of, knows what God wants to call us to, Even if that thing that God is calling us to seems really scary. Even if it seems really dull. Even if it seems against our better judgment. God calls each of us. Calls some of us to travel off and build new things like those track builders. Calls others of us to stay put. To keep people safe. Like the signal operators cause some people to be like the princess in the story, living in a difficult and frightening place and yet standing up for God's kingdom, for a kingdom of peace and of justice and of hope for all. God calls some of us to offer refreshments, whether that's literally or metaphorically. God calls some of us to announce the stations. Some people's jobs might seem more exciting than ours. I always wanted to be a televangelist with a white suit and waving and smiling. And I don't spend much of my time doing that. But I do go where God calls me. Do you? Where is God calling you? Because God calls each of us. And in all our varying tasks, we're called together to follow Jesus together. Jesus who promises, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. The way we follow Jesus is to do it together, to listen to one another, to work together, to pray. And so we're going to use some traditional words now as we offer ourselves to God. And I want to say to you, don't worry if you don't know exactly where God is calling you. Be open to that. Say, God, I don't know where you're calling me, but take me and use me. Siblings in Christ, let us accept our place within this covenant, which God has made with us and with all who are called to be Christ's disciples. This means that by the help of the Holy Spirit, we accept God's purpose for us. The call to love and serve God in all our life and work. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honour, others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and material interests. Others are contrary to both. In some we may please Christ and please ourselves. In others, we cannot please Christ, except by denying ourselves. Yet the power to do all these things is given to us in Christ who strengthens us. Therefore, let us make this covenant of God our own. Let us give ourselves to him, trusting in his promises 
and relying on his grace. It is God who does the leading. It is God who knows the plan. We put ourselves into those eternal arms. Eternal God, in your faithful and enduring love, you call us to share in your gracious covenant in Jesus Christ. In obedience, we hear and accept your commands. In love, we seek to do your perfect will. With joy, we offer ourselves anew to you. I encourage you to repeat these words line on line with me. We are no longer our own, but yours. Repeat after me. I am no longer my own, but yours. Your will, not mine, be done in all things. Wherever you place me, in all that I do, and in all that I may endure. When there is work for me, and when there is none, when I am troubled, and when I am at peace. Your will be done when I am valued. And when I am disregarded. When I find fulfilment and when it is lacking. When I have all things And when I have nothing. I willingly offer all that I have and am. To serve you as and where you choose. Glorious and blessed God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. You are mine and I am yours. May it be so forever. Let this covenant now made on earth be fulfilled in heaven. Amen. Just as Moses didn't know what God was calling him to do, didn't think he was cut out for it, so each of us face those moments when we say, God, what are you calling me to now? And together, with one another and with the Holy Spirit, we commit and recommit to follow Jesus, to love one another, to love the Lord our God with all that we are and all that we have. And so may you go into this new day, this new life, day on day, knowing the blessing of God, creator, redeemer and sustainer, calling you to follow. Amen.